Shelby and his lovely wife Rita Steele are with us today. When I picked them up at the airport yesterday, uh, they're from California. Uh, and they live in Pacific Gas and Electric Territory. And so when we were driving from the airport yesterday, they were looking out the window saying, oh, look, they have electricity in Texas. <laughs> we, ha we have electricity all the time here, all the time, constantly. Uh, and, we have a, we, and we have a healthy degree of liberty and freedom and opportunity here in Texas, too. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work done over the past few years comparing the Texas model to the California model. It's pretty clear to those of us in Texas, anyway, which one works, which one creates economic growth, and which one doesn't. Uh, but on the other hand, as an American, I take no pleasure in seeing one of our states being run into the ground. So we, we, uh, we hope and pray that states like California and Illinois can learn either through, either through wisdom or pain the errors of their ways. You may have seen Shelby Steele on cable news programs. You may, he's frequently on the Laura Ingram show. Uh, you may have heard him on a talk radio show. You may have read one of his many books. Uh, Shelby Steele is among the most distinguished speakers we've ever had at one of these lectures. He is a winner of the Bradley Prize from the, Rep from the Bradley Foundation. Uh, he is the Robert and Marion Oster Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, where he works with and knows people like Victor Davis Hanson and so many of the other folks that we all know and admire. He specializes in the study of race relations, multiculturalism, and affirmative action, and he has been a fellow at the Hoover Institute since 1994. He's written a number of provocative books, uh, including one that some of you were able to grab copies of today. He is the author of The Content of Our Character, A New Vision of Race in America, which was a prize-winning book. He is a prize-winning documentarian, documentary filmmaker, author, speaker, and writer. He's written extensively for major publications, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. He's a contributing editor at Harper's Magazine, and he's one of my intellectual heroes. Uh, he speaks the truth about multiculturalism, identity politics, and some of those social problems that are causing us so much problems in our country today. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from him. It's a distinct honor and pleasure to have you here. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming Shelby Steele. Navigate your way through the yeah. field here. <laughs> there we go. But that's for later. Thank you Thank so you. much. That was a great Thank you for that introduction. Thank IPI for inviting me. Um, you know, I, I am, as Tom said, a Californian. It's nice at the moment to be in Dallas. Um, when I left, some of my trees in my yard were, they were calling the fire. They sort of bended into it, but so far we're safe and, and uh, so on and so on. But I, I cannot defend California. <laughs> won't try, won't go there. Um, it's worse than you think, though, I, I can, can say that. Well, I was invited today to talk about identity politics. Um, and so that's what I'll do. Uh, but what is most interesting to me is where identity politics came from. Um, how did we get to be such a splintered society uh, at a time, 60 years after the signing of the Civil Rights Bill, when you would think uh, this issue had somehow been put behind us? And so I, I, I have been thinking about that. Why, where did it come from, how, and so forth. I think, like so many things that we deal with today, it began in the 1960s. Uh, and let me look at the 60s for just a minute. There are many things that happened there. But one thing I think we have not paid a, enough attention to is that the 60s, which I think is the most transformative decade in American history, was distinguished by one sort of cultural event. Americans were 
forced by several social movements across the society to face the reality that this great country had partaken of evil in, and had participated and had used slavery. Had Jim Crow segregation, women were second class citizens, so forth. Um, so we had this tension. On the one hand, the greatest society and country that has ever existed by far. On the other hand, a country that had indulged in evil. Well, that changed everything. I don't think we've been the same as a country since. I think we are still struggling with that, digesting it. That history is working itself through our contemporary lives in many, many ways, and identity politics is just one. Uh, but that, that is, it seems to me, the tension. Greatness on the one hand, evil on the other, that our culture comes out of. Our culture uh, grows out of that. Uh, I could go on about that, but, um, but well, one point is that the, the Constitution gave us the ideas to overcome our evil. Uh, we, we, were, we had evolved. We were, our greatness saved us and, and changed us around in ways that, that uh, no other society I'm aware of has, uh, has that ever happened in. So the first thing that is different that came to us from the 60s is simply this knowledge of living with evil, living with it as a, as a charge against us, having to defend against it, having to, to, uh, to be vulnerable to being linked with it. That, that uh, has made for a profound difference. Another thing is that when civil rights uh, sort of won its victory in the 60s. Uh, black Americans did not go away from America. You, usually in a situation like that, after World War II, after the Holocaust, Jews moved elsewhere. They created Israel, took a deep breath and, and built this, this great nation. Uh, they also went to diasporas, America, South America, and so forth. After 1964 Civil Rights Bill, making discrimination illegal, blacks continued to live in the United States. It was our home. There was no other home. Uh, it, it, and so there, the tension in this society from living in proximity to people who, have, who were once the victims of that society again, is uh, I think the tension that our, our culture uh, comes out of imposed upon us was a relentless moral accountability that had, had not been here before, had been, had been repressed. Uh, even the Civil War did not bring it out, but the 60s, the 60s did. And um, it, we as our society, as a, as a civilization really, um, we've lived with this moral accountability now for, for a very long time. This generated this circumstance, close proximity to former victims, uh, moral accountability, knowledge of evil, this generated a new liberalism, a new form of liberalism in the United States, political as well as cultural. But a new liberalism came out of it, and that liberalism, no matter what it claims to be after, no matter what it says, is primarily devoted to recovering the moral authority that America lost by acknowledging its sins in the 60s. You can't acknowledge sins on that scale uh, without losing some degree of moral authority, the authority to, to uh, conduct the business of your society. I'll never forget, um, in I think it was 1967, and uh, Muhammad Ali at a, at a news conference 
saying he would not go to the draft. He would not be drafted. And he pointed his finger and he said, those little yellow people never did anything to me. But you did. I want to fight you. Well, what does that say about the authority of American life? It becomes very fragile. Some groups, uh, blacks particularly, who were the victims of, of the evil, come to have an enormous power and influence uh, in that culture, far beyond uh, their numbers, uh, because they hold this larger, uglier truth. It gives them power. It gives them an energy that, that they might not otherwise have. Uh, and and uh, it creates, is created in black life, uh, again, a source of power. And we created a generation of what it's often called the grievance industry. I've called it that. Uh, uh, the Al Sharpton's, Jesse Jackson's of the world uh, realized the vulnerability of America, that it, it just lost that moral authority and sw came swept in and took uh, enormous advantage of it for the last 60 years now. So, this liberalism, um, quick example. At Stanford University, where I am in 1990, I believe it was, um, students demonstrated against the course in Western civilization. Jesse Jackson came to the campus and demonstrated with them. Um, Western civilization is a class that's pretty much at the center of liberal arts education across the country. I know when I was in college, it was absolutely mandatory. It was part of the required curriculum and so forth. Stanford University eliminated it after the protest. Um, and it got worse from there. Other universities emulated it across the country. And Western Civ is now a very rare uh, uh, sort of class. And when you deny Western Civ, you're denying those students knowledge of the Enlightenment, of the Age of Reason, uh, of the Reformation. Uh, also, all of this great, slow, painful, careful human evolution that has enlightened the entire world. You can't study because they were also imperialistic, colonialists, and racist. Um, <clears throat> you see the past coming forward and doing damage in the present. Uh, Stanford still does not require Western civilization. Uh, what we call political correctness is, is uh, for the most part, uh, speaking with, with moral authority in mind more than truth. Um, I love to use the example when I was a, when I was a young, when a kid, uh, we were called colored people. Uh, and then the uh, 50s and 60s went on and, and the civil rights movement came to the forefront. You had great leaders like Martin Luther King um, and so forth. We became Negroes. And we were Negroes for a good while until the late 60s and the black power movement and, and so forth. Then we became black. Black with a certain tone of militants. And, and anger. Um, <clears throat> actually, I kind of like black. I think it get to the point. <laughs> <clears throat> Evolution continued. Then we were called Afro-American, African-Americans. We hadn't been to Africa, uh, but we were called African-Americans as if there was sort of a combination of two cultures, as if we weren't one. Uh, but it was a term that again had uh, more moral authority than, than other terms. Uh, today, interestingly, we are called people of color. Uh, 
not colored people, but people of color. What is the difference? <laughs> Same. Well, you know, the difference is that people of color has moral authority and legitimacy. <clears throat> colored people is associated with racism and bigotry of one kind or another. <clears throat> a glass of water would, uh, my throat, I drank too much coffee, I think. Oh, here it is, that's all right. Thank you, I got it. I'm sure nothing was intended that the water was hidden in that, that particular way, but. <laughs> Uh, Anti-Americanism was another theme of this new liberalism because anti-Americanism dissociated you from the evil America, the racist, bigoted, so forth America. And so this, this really terrible irony, liberalism embraced anti-Americanism. <coughs> and it still plays a role in liberal thinking, liberal thought, and you listen to the current array of Democratic candidates, you, you see that you hear that undertone of contempt really for America. Um, almost no effort to be celebratory uh, and to say that this country overcame one of the greatest human problems ever, uh, that it stood up to, to its past. Uh, you know, give, giving America some credit. Uh, we, don't <coughs> we don't get that. So that's, those are all ways in which we dissociate from the ugly racist past and that always wins us back the moral authority to conduct our business. And it brings legitimacy to our institutions. Why institutions love diversity and so on, love the affirmative action. They could go out and get blacks, bring them in, and create an optic of racial innocence. Uh, well, around our conference table, we have at least three or four black faces, and we have women, and we have, blah, blah, and we're so proud. Um, well, uh, that's all, again, a kind of liberalism that. Um, dissociates us. <clears throat> it also uses association. When Nancy Pelosi um, came out against uh, President Trump's uh, practices on the border, his, his, uh, his desire for a wall, she, in stunned, perfect expression of this liberalism, said, the wall is an immorality. It's an immorality. Uh, you know, it's like um, the old bigoted racist America. And she was quite effective. This, this power is not an innocent one. It's a power that is, that is effective. She was quite effective. And we still have at this moment a very confused um, Im immigration policy. Um, well, the power of liberalism is again this power Nancy Pelosi says, I have moral authority and you don't. I have legitimacy and you don't. Uh, and so I'll st I will stop you. I will, I will uh, you won't get a wall. Uh, in the 60s, I think that liberal, the genius, and I think it was really that of, of liberalism, was that it devised a way to extract power from American, America's history of evil. Nancy Pelosi turned that history into a currency of power, put it to, to work in the marketplace, and was very, very successful. Um, so, um, that it, that's how it works. One other thing that they do is that, that I think was ingenious is that liberalism created an identity. It didn't offer people 
and ideology, had no ideology, still does, does not, uh, didn't do that. It offered people an identity of innocence. If you become a liberal, by definition, you are not a racist. You are not a bigot. You are not an evil, old-fashioned, ugly American. You are innocent of that America, of all that evil. Well, think of the political power that redounds to the American left by being able to offer people an identity of innocence. That's a lot of power. What else does liberalism in America today have to offer? What else does it have to give, to, to give itself, bring power to it? Absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. But moral authority taken from America's history and so forth um, gives us the liberalism we have today and we can't underestimate it. it is, it is enormously powerful, and you see that in the candidates and the Democrats, just offer people all sorts of things and, and uh, everything will be good. This liberalism is always looking to put itself in the, on the moral high ground and understands the moral high ground and the, the importance of it better than, than certainly better than the, than the right. The problem, one of the problems conservatism has is that it has no identity of innocence to offer people. Um, and so there, there it, is, it, is, it can't compete in that sense. And since the 60s, conservatism has been the minority party. Conservatism as an ideology, I think, has been, as I've called it before, an insurgent ideology. Conservatism is fighting against con the, the uh, conventional wisdom, against the establishment. Um, it, it has been in that position and has slowly sort of rather uh, organized itself, gathered itself, uh, and, and certainly has, has begun, <coughs> we'll talk more about it in a minute, begun to sharply fight back. But boy, it took a long time, it took over 60 years since uh, that came about. Uh, liberalism also generated, uh, and this I think is even more important, <coughs> generated what I call a culture of deference. A culture of deference. Sixty years of liberalism uh, generated, you know, ideologies and politics and so forth are one thing, but the culture is another thing, a much broader, deeper thing. And, and politics is sort of downstream from, from culture. Uh, liberalism created a culture in America I call the culture of deference. Um, and deference is redemptive. We offer deference because we say, well, yes, we were this way, we were racist, we were so forth. And we accept that, we own up to that, and now we want to redeem ourselves. And so the way we will redeem ourselves is to defer to anybody who says they were a victim of that old ugly America. We will defer. We will lower standards. We will ask less. We will defer, we will bow to the victimization they endured. We'll, we will, when we, run, we approach a black, well, oh my God. We will presume victimization. Uh, and we will defer to it and we will make, create some special programs, some special policies and, and we, because we want to redeem ourselves from that ugly accusation that we are as racist as America, the America of old. So deference is, tries to be redemptive, tries to, uh, always tries to do that. Um, in the form it takes is always, a, there's always a note of apology. Uh, you can look at almost any one of the social programs that came out of the 60s and there were, there were countless school busing, affirmative action, uh, so forth. 
affirmative action is, is a, a sort of a good example. Um, you, we, are, we are going to apologize to young blacks for what was done in the past. We're going to, we're going to number one, apologize. And we are now going to give you a preference in terms of getting into college. We're going to stand for, uh, excuse me, Harvard University, for example, 8% of every freshman class is black. If you held everybody to the same standards, you didn't lower the standards for blacks, only 1% of, of the freshman class at Harvard would be black. Now, one of my real pet peeves is think about being a member of that 1% who fought like heck, developed themselves, worked hard, got there on their own merit, same as everybody else. Think of the dignity, the self-esteem that would come to them. How could, you, how could there be a social program that would get, bestow that on you? That, and so you are then going to deny that young black person uh, the opportunity to achieve that kind of self-confidence and dignity. Why? So you can claim moral authority, that you're on the side of the good, that you're helping these pitiful people. If they're not pitiful, we won't help them. Uh, we, we want to be seen as the, again, the society actively, actively redeeming itself. Uh, and so deference does all that, deference. Uh, bows to the presumed suffering of the victim. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Well, our President Obama was a kind of textbook case of deference. Uh, he was um, certainly, I think, the most deferential president we have ever had by many miles. Uh, there was his famous Cairo speech that he gave in which he, in a sense, apologized uh, to the Arab world for I don't know what. But he, he apologized and he, uh, he when he met cer certain Arab leaders, he literally bowed in deference. President of the United States most powerful country in history. And you, and you bow like that. Uh, well, that was, Mr., uh, that was Mr. Obama. In a more sophisticated way, uh, Obama stood for globalism as opposed to nationalism. Uh, he, he believed that the Europeans, uh, who we were supporting militarily and otherwise, that the Europeans really um, were, were on the moral high ground, and that America should sort of recede, um, thank you, that America should recede from, uh, and s step back a little bit and count itself as just one of many nations. Um, the uh, deal with Iran is another uh, example of deference where you basically make a, a deal with uh, a country and you give them everything they want and then you throw in a, a, a mountain of hard cash on top of it. Uh, hoping for what? Hoping that the world will see you, Mr. Obama, as a nice guy, as a pleasant personality, as a person of genuine goodwill even though all that money is going to go to support terrorism across the Middle, the middle East. Uh, but Obama loved deference. It was his self-definition. Well, um, <coughs> I'm going to watch my time here. Um, American exceptionalism. Uh, Obama and people around him thought was an outrage. 
that it was, a, it was evil. It was associated again with the bigoted past. Uh, and so American exceptionalism had to be, um, we, we had to, we couldn't practice it, couldn't execute it in the world. Um, that brings us at last to identity politics. Uh, and here identity politics is again a deferential policy that defers to the victimization of any number of groups. We're gonna bring in, so we're gonna have somebody run for president who's both a female and black. We're gonna have somebody over here who is Asian and, and we're gonna we're going to pick all these identities and we're going to presume, we're gonna presume that if you belong to any of them, you were victimized by that ugly American past. And so we're going to, in that sense, defer to you and we're gonna give you a job. We want your face of color on our magazine. I got my alumni magazine from my undergraduate school, Coe College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, and on the cover of the magazine was a black student, an Asian student, a white student, and, a, and somebody who looked a little Hispanic, whatever that, that would be. Uh, the school is probably at least 90% white. <laughs> but deference works, works that way. Another last problem with it is that deference and de de get my tongue right here. Deference always hides the real problem. Whenever you see people uh, acting deferential, coming up with all sorts of problems, they're, they're, always, hard, they're always hiding the real problem. Um, it's, we give black students affirmative action uh, at, uh, at universities, we defer to them. What's the real problem? The real problem is that not enough black students are developed, have been educated enough, have been seriously challenged enough to be competitive. So we ignore all of that and concentrate on giving them a racial preference and creating a, a perfect picture of, of, of innocence. Um, I love uh, Frederick Douglass's statement, what, after the uh, Civil War and, and what, what should we do now? We freed all these blacks, what should we do with them? His answer was, leave us alone. Love that. That's, that's ought to be, uh, um, uh, uh, with blacks, the call to arms. That's the challenge. Nothing. Don't do anything. Leave us alone. We'll figure out everything. We'll make our way in the world. Uh, we, without having to take care of your guilt, your anxiety, uh, about moral authority and so forth. Quickly, um, President Trump is many, many things, but the one thing that he is absolutely not is deferential. <laughs> He ain't that, boy. Uh, well, this is, this is the, the, I think, the real source of, of the, the, all of the hatred that goes toward uh, President Trump. He's diametrically opposed to President Obama, but um, the, the he represents a clash of cultures. He, President Trump is really more a culture warrior than he is a political warrior. His real uh, impact, lasting impact, is, is going to be on the culture. Trump says, I like American exceptionalism. We are the greatest country in the world. In Europe, you will pay us for all of these organizations that we support, for, for militarily protecting you. You will do that. 
uh, why, should we, why should we defer to you? What are you doing for us? Thank you. Uh, and so he, he brings a kind of freshness, that, but it clashes with the modern America, which is a, a, a culture now of deference. We are deeply a culture of deference. Uh, and he just is simply, in every way, in any way, uh, not deferential, never was, never will be. Um, and his, I remember when I saw him come down the, the escalator, the famous trip down the escalator when, when he was announcing for president. And I just had an instinct that this was, this was the guy. He owed nothing to anybody. This was, this was a guy who didn't care what you thought of him. He, this, and that is the, that's Churchillian. That's the mark of greatness. Does that mean he's going to be great? I don't know. Uh, but I did, I did anxiously want to vote for him uh, because I knew he would really shake things up. We might get out of the stultified culture of deference that has just overwhelmed us and is, uh, is defeating the larger culture. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, Trump's, uh, the real anger at him is cultural, much more than it is political. Uh, and uh, that that is why uh, so many people are, are just outraged and apoplectic about, uh, about him. Uh, and he, it's also why he is the most exciting man in the world. Nobody knows what he'll do next or say next. Uh, but I do know he loves America. Doesn't mean he won't make mistakes. He certainly will and has. Uh, but think of the culture of, of deference. Think of Obama. Do nothing ever. Um, and, and be endlessly deferential. Uh, well, so I think we're lucky to have Mr. Trump. I think he will be a good thing, not just for our politics, but for our culture. Our culture needs to get back in touch uh, with what is real. And, uh, and, she, and this society, more than anything, needs to stop being ashamed of itself. We, our history is full of, of real human pain and real evil. But we have struggled against it more than any other people on the planet. We have to keep doing that. Uh, we can't do it by deferring. Deferring just wins moral authority for, frankly, for white Americans. That's all it wins. It doesn't do anything. Blacks are worse off today than they were in the 1950s. Farther behind whites. After 60 years, after 24 trillion dollars, of social programs. Worse off. Well, let me stop there. Thank you. <laughs>